was terrific. Hey, my name is Todd Malone. It is great to have you here today. Um, if you don't know me, one of the things that you need to know about me is that I'm an absolute mess. Um, it's pretty obvious any time my wife, Ann, goes out of town. The staff can tell. I start showing up. It's like, well, those things don't go together. Um, Ann wasn't there to dress him. I had a couple of friends the last time Ann was out of town, which was she actually just got back from being in Wisconsin. And a couple of friends that kind of got word, and uh, I would get a text. It's like, did the pot roast have some extra? Why don't you come over and eat? And then a day or two later, made some soup. Why don't you come over and get some and take home? Basically, it's Ann's gone. We know that you'll starve to death <laughs> if we don't take care of you. Well, Ann went to Wisconsin. She was there for a short trip visiting family. And for most of us who live in Texas, going to Wisconsin in January, especially in a winter like the winter that we have just had, is like being dropped onto another planet. Wisconsin is a really bizarre place where they don't wear flip-flops in January. Right? They'll put on like 18 layers of clothes to walk 10 feet to the mailbox. And even though the Packers were mathematically eliminated from the postseason sometime around August, they still think the Super Bowl is about green and gold. It's a different world. But not for Ann. Wisconsin is where she grew up. For her, being in Wisconsin feels like being home. For her, looking out a window at a field of snow feels like home. The smell and warmth and comfort of a fireplace will feel at home. The coziness of a sweater feels like home. Names like Bart Starr, Brett Favre, and Aaron Rodgers feel like home to her. When Ann goes to Wisconsin in the winter, it revives her, it rejuvenates her, it restores her. And that is exactly what she needed after a really hectic, stressful December. You see, there's something really powerful about the idea of going home. Home is supposed to be a safe place, a place of rest and warmth. It's supposed to be a place where we are known and we are loved. And that's why we so deeply long for home. It's true, especially if we're in a really troubled time or a stressful season. Something deep inside of us says, I just want to go home where I'm loved, where I'm safe, and where I'm free to be who I am. And when we enter into John chapter 14, that is what Jesus is talking about. He is talking about going home. We are in the middle, actually we're in the fourth week of our series on the upper room. That's a very creative title for uh, a series of chapters that are about Jesus in a place called the upper room. And remember what's going on in this, in this passage, in this section of scripture. This is just before, it's literally hours before Jesus is going to be arrested. He's going to go to trial, which is just a mockery of justice. And then he is going to be killed on a cross and buried. And three days later, he's going to be raised from the dead. And then in this amazing scene in scripture, days after he's raised from the dead, he is going to send back into heaven to be with the father. And the disciples are going to witness that. But think about that moment from the perspective of the disciples. They have dedicated their lives over the last three years to following Jesus, to working with Jesus, to ministering with Jesus. They have learned from Jesus. Jesus is built into them every single day. And then he is gone. The upper room is Jesus preparing them. For that moment. 
In John 14, 1 through 14, Jesus is going to comfort them by talking about going home. But here's what I want you to see. The emphasis is less on home than it is on Jesus' character. And the point is that Jesus can be trusted. And you'll see the word belief used again and again in this passage. Jesus can be trusted in the work that he is doing for our future. He can be trusted in what he has revealed about himself and the Father. And he can be trusted that he is doing work through us and in us right now. And it starts in verses 1 through 4 where the emphasis is on trusting Jesus' work for you. As he prepares for your future. Uh, this is a mug that belongs to my son. It's kind of hard to tell. But you can sort of see the face on the mug. It's, um, it's a cat that is clearly not having a good day. This cat has issues. And when you look inside the mug, which is to the right, you can see why this cat has issues. You see, if you hit a little button on the handle, that little white thing in there starts to spin. And so what it does is it starts agitating and stirring up whatever is inside that mug. So how would you feel if someone could hit a button in your life and start stirring up everything that's inside of you? Sometimes we call that love, but um, <laughs> that idea of being stirred up on the inside of being unsettled, of being shaken, is the literal idea behind the word in verse 1 that's translated troubled. It was a word that was used when you stirred up liquid. It was a word that was even used to describe the ocean in a storm, an ocean that is dark where the waves are violent and out of control. And so what Jesus is saying is that he is aware that the disciples are in danger of, at the very core of who they are, being tossed and shaken by fear and confusion, by anxiety. It's the sort of emotion that you feel when you face unexpected tragedy or disappointment. It's a type of deep inner turmoil. Jesus knows that this is what the disciples are facing, and in response to that knowledge, what Jesus does is he gives them a command. And isn't it interesting that the command is actually passive? Don't allow your heart, the core of who you are, to be troubled, to be stirred up. See, I think what he's saying is, don't allow yourself to stay in that inner turmoil. I don't think he's saying that the turmoil is wrong. The reason I say that is because this exact same word is about to be used about Jesus. When he is in the garden of Gethsemane. And it says that he will be troubled. Exact same word. But what Jesus does is he doesn't stay in the trouble. What Jesus does is he looks to the father. He trusts the father. And he moves forward in obedience. And that is exactly what Jesus is calling the disciples to do in these verses. He wants the disciples to trust him. To the point of a positive, obedient response. That's actually what the word belief means. It's to trust in something to the point of a positive response. And Jesus wants them to trust that he is leaving them to do something for them that he cannot do if he were to stay. The work that he is doing for them is that he is preparing a home. Some of your translations say, in my father's home, or in my father's house, are many mansions. I have very clear memories of being a little kid, watching a TV preacher bouncing up and down, really excited about the mansion that he was going to have in heaven. And his mansion was going to be huge. And his mansion was going to be amazing. And I was just a little kid thinking, man, I hope I get a duplex. Um, but he was so excited about his giant mansion. Well, here's the problem with what he was saying. The word that tra is translated mansion actually refers to a communal dwelling place. 
You see, what Jesus is picturing is something that was very common in their days, something that they would have immediately thought of. It's a place where many people live together in one big complex. Parents, children, grandparents, servants, and others lived in one complex that often had an open common courtyard between it. We have a really good picture of that exact sort of thing today. They're called apartments. It's a place of community. It's a place of of living together. And you see, here's what's amazing. What is causing them to be troubled? Absence, separation. What's causing them to be troubled will one day be undone in the Father's house. Jesus is making a place for them where they will live in perfect community and be provided for. But most importantly, they will be with their heavenly father. Because it is the father's house. It is a place of loving acceptance. It is a place of safety. It is a place of warmth and a place of provision and care. Jesus leaving will be good for them because he is preparing their home. That is what the disciples need to trust. And it's what we need to trust as well. We need to trust that Jesus right now is at work for our good. He is preparing a future for us that is a loving community, a safe, warm, a place that we are provided for. It is what we always have longed for. And there is a day that we are going to experience that perfectly in heaven. But here's the challenge for us, for the people in this room. You see, we have an assignment. And our assignment is that we are to give people a glimpse of what that looks like. We are to give people a glimpse of what it looks like to see and be in a community that is loving and safe and warm and cares for one another. We are called to give one another a picture of home. So let me start you with this question. What is troubling you? What is stirring you at a deep core level? What is going on in your life that makes you say, I just want to go home? You know, preparing a home for the disciples didn't change their circumstances. What it did is it gave them a picture of their future. And that gave them hope. And that allowed them to endure. Can you look at what troubles you and trust that there is hope? There is a hope that doesn't depend on you. It doesn't depend on your work, but it depends on the work that Jesus is doing. He is getting home ready. Verses 5 through 11 shift the focus. And they shift the focus to what home looks like and how you get there. And the point is that we can trust what Jesus has revealed, especially about who he is. It's interesting in these passages, Jesus interacts with two different disciples. Thomas asks a question that is basically, whether he knows it or not, he is asking the question of how do we get home from here? Philip wants Jesus to essentially show him what does home look like. In each interaction, did you notice that Jesus uses an I am statement to reveal something about himself? And the first, Taylor alluded to this earlier, it's one of the most famous passages in the Bible. We find it in verse 6 where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's one to really think about it, one of the most remarkable statements any human being could make. Of course, Jesus wasn't just a human being. And so he could make it honestly. Do you notice that Jesus does not say that he knows the way to God? Do you notice that he does not say that he can point out the way to the Father? What he says is that he is the way. 
You don't get to the Father just by listening to good advice. You don't get to the Father by living up to some standard. You get to the Father through Jesus. And you can argue that when Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life, what he is saying is that he is the way because he is the truth. He is the ultimate revelation of who God is. You could say that he is the way because he is the life. He is our only source of life, both now and for eternity. He is the only place where we will find a life that is truly abundant. See, we are designed for unbroken, intimate relationship with a God who loves us. We are designed to live in the Father's house. We deeply, deeply want to know. We yearn for knowing the way home, knowing the truth about God, knowing the truth about ourselves. And we we yearn to have the life that only God provides. At the very core of who we are, these yearnings show up and manifest themselves in all kinds of ways. Here's an example from my life. Sometimes when Ann gets upset with me, has that ever happened? Um, There's this thing that goes on inside of me. And what goes on inside of me is I'm feeling like a child who is being scolded. It's not because of anything that she does. This is not about her. It's because of my own baggage. And I feel incompetent. And I feel diminished. And I want to fight back and prove that I matter. That I am not incompetent. That I am not a child. You see, what I'm trying to learn is that my action really has nothing to do with the issue that Anne is upset about. It has everything to do with me desperately wanting to matter and be valuable. And in that moment, what I believe is that my value depends on what Anne thinks. In that moment, I believe that Anne is the ultimate way to meet my core need to be valued and loved. I believe that Anne is the ultimate way to understand the truth about me. And I believe that in Anne, I find the ultimate abundant life and that it depends on her. These are the core yearnings that just come out in really bizarre ways. We were built to have those yearnings met in a perfect relationship with a perfect God who loves us flawlessly. Anne cannot do that. She was not designed to do that. She cannot be the way, the truth, or the life. We will not completely experience that perfect love, that perfect safety, that perfect freedom to be who we were meant to be, this side of heaven. We will not experience that until we are at home with the Father. In the meantime, we are going to feel every day that something is missing. We will feel every day that we have a longing that we want fulfilled. And we will try to find our way one way or another. And if we do not find the way through Jesus, we will try to find it through career. We will try to find it through relationships or wealth or our brilliance or our influence. But those things can't fill our longing. Jesus is the only way home. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. Hours before he is about to go to the cross. He will die. So everything that separates us from a perfect, loving God and keeps us from home will be forgiven. He is the only way because he is the only one who can restore our relationship with the Father. All we have to do is ask. 
The second I am statement is repeated in verses 10 and 11. Jesus says, I am the Father, and the Father is, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Jesus' point to Philip is that if he wants to know what God is like, look at Jesus. If you want to know what God feels about something, look at what Jesus feels about something. If you want to know how God treats and feels about people who are caught in sin, look at how Jesus treats them. If you want to know how God feels about hypocrisy, look at how Jesus feels about hypocrisy. Jesus' point is that if you want to know what God is like, look at me, look at Jesus. Jesus is the perfect revelation of God. And he can be that perfect revelation because of the unbreakable unity that exists between Jesus and God. It's not simply that Jesus came on a divine mission on behalf of the Father. It is the Father himself on a divine mission through the Son. The Father is on mission to love you and rescue you through Jesus. The very foundation of what we believe is not that Jesus was right about God. It is that God was fully present in Jesus with the mission to bring you home. Jesus' love, grace, mercy, care are perfect pictures of home because they are the perfect pictures of the Father. John's deepest desire is for us to see that Jesus is the perfect revealer of God. He is the perfect picture of life in the Father's house because he is the perfect picture of the Father. Do you trust that? Do you trust that to see Jesus is to see the Father? Or do you fear that Jesus might love you, but God's probably against you? That what he's doing is just looking for a reason to reject you. Because you see, if that's what you think, then not even heaven is going to feel like home. You can trust that you can be loved by Jesus. And being loved by Jesus, you are loved by the Father. Do you trust that Jesus is the only way home? Or do you cling to the belief that your yearnings for love and safety and freedom can be met this side of heaven? And without Jesus. Jesus is at work for you right now. He is preparing a home for you. But he is also the way to that home. And he is the perfect picture of what that home is like. Jesus calls you to trust him. That he will get you home and it will be worth it. But he also asks you to trust him as you wait for home. You need to trust Jesus' ministry through you. And that's what the rest of the passage is about. Okay, let's be honest. We never admit this. Sometimes we read the Bible, we say, um, something is being left out here. I know it. There's supposed to be something else here, and it's not. And verse 12 is one of those places. We are certain that verse 12 is supposed to end with something like, ha ha, just kidding. Right, Jesus can't be serious. Jesus healed people. He walked on water. He raised the dead. He did a bunch of amazing miracles. I can't even get dressed without Ann. He can't really mean that I will do greater things than him. But what if he was serious? What if that's exactly what he meant? What if Jesus has an assignment for you while you wait to go home? And what if God will do things through you as you carry out that assignment that are greater than walking on water or healing disease or casting out demons? I think that's exactly what he means in verse 12. And the reason, according to Jesus, that we will do these greater works is because we are going to the Father. He is going to the Father. So what in the world is he talking about? Look at it this way. Everything that Jesus did during his ministry, everything he said, everything he preached, every person he healed was pointing towards the cross and the resurrection. Every miracle, every moment of teaching was a declaration of who Jesus was, what he was doing, and how people should respond. It was only after Jesus was resurrected and taken back into heaven, only after the Holy Spirit came that Jesus' followers started to be able to clearly 
put the picture together of, of what had been going on. It was only then that there was clarity. It's only after Jesus leaves that the disciples put together what it all meant. When Jesus calmed the storm, it wasn't just about keeping them safe in a boat. It was a declaration. It was a declaration that Jesus ruled over the forces even of nature. When Jesus heals the sick, it's not just about making someone better. It is that, but it's a declaration that Jesus rules even over the painful consequences of living in a broken world. When Jesus casts out a demon, it wasn't just to free someone, although it was that, but it was also a declaration that he has power over all spiritual forces. And so when Jesus who has power over creation, who rules over sin and death, who is sovereign even over the spiritual world, when he goes to the cross for us, it is a declaration of extraordinary sacrificial love. The greater work that we do is sharing that message that they would only put together After he was gone. It was sharing the message of the good news of Jesus. In a way that was clearer and more powerful than was possible before the cross. That message will completely transform lives both today and for eternity. People who hated God and loved themselves become transformed into people who love God and serve others. People whose lives seem hopeless and beyond recovery find redemption. And God blesses us with the ability to do that work and to do it through us. And I'm watching this happen all over FBC. Tell you about one of them right now. We have someone here who has recently met someone through work. I've never met this person that they've met, never been to the church as far as I know. Um, But this person is in crisis. Don't know her story. But what I know is that this FBCer didn't call the church and say, hey, can we start a program for people in crisis so she could hand that person off? She didn't call and ask a staff member or an elder or a deacon and say, can I just give this person to you so you can take care of them? What this FBCer did was say, God wants to transform this person's life, and he gives me the opportunity to be a part of it. And she has become personally involved in helping and pointing that person to Jesus. And versions of that story are playing out throughout FBC. Not because FBC is great, but because Jesus is at work through us. And the reason we know that it's Jesus at work is because of verses 13 and 14. It's Jesus who acts. Our job is to ask. We often take these verses out of their context and treat them like they're some sort of a magic formula that Jesus just randomly threw out there so we would be able to get whatever we wanted from God. All we have to do is just add in Jesus' name at the end of our prayers, and then God will give us what we want. But when you look at the context, that's not what's going on. See, to ask something in someone's name in that culture meant to ask for something that would further that person's reputation. It would be something that was for their good and accomplish their plans. So to pray in Jesus' name means that we want, that what we are asking for, we want it to further Jesus' reputation, not ours. We want it to accomplish his plans, not ours. And that makes sense with verse 12. Jesus' plan is that we will share the clear and powerful message of forgiveness and new life that is found only in Jesus. And when we pray in Jesus' name, we are saying, may what I ask for further your reputation, and help you, help you accomplish your plan of letting people know the good news about you. 
So we have people in this church that we pray for diligently that their health would be restored or that their jobs would be restored or their relationships would be restored. And we should pray for those things. But when we pray for them in Jesus' name, know what we are asking. We are asking for the Lord to work, not for us and our glory, but so that people would know how amazing Jesus is. And we are leaving it in his hands. And if there is a better way than for the healing or the restored job or the restored relationship, if there is a better way for people to know how amazing Jesus is by praying in Jesus' name, we are saying we are okay with that. We don't need our own way because we trust that Jesus is at work through us right now to accomplish his plans. And guess what? He will always say yes to the prayer to further Jesus' reputation and spread the good news. Do you trust that Jesus wants to work through you right now? Do you trust that he has a purpose for you as you wait to go home? Do you trust that your life does not have to be without hope or purpose? Waiting to go home is not like sitting in a doctor's office, bored, having nothing to do but read some old magazines. Waiting to go home is to live on assignment and trust that Jesus is and will accomplish extraordinary things through you. Jesus didn't take the trouble out of the disciples' life. And I think in part because troubling situations are amazing opportunities for us to learn to trust. They are opportunities for us to learn to trust that Jesus is at work right now to prepare a future for us. It is a future without trouble. It is a future where our deepest longings for home are fulfilled. Our troubles are an opportunity to teach us to trust that all other ways that we try to go home will fail us except Jesus. Troubles are an opportunity to reveal that we have a purpose no matter what is going on in our lives. And that takes us to the point, both of the passage and the sermon. Let your trouble reveal Jesus' trustworthiness. When you are troubled, you are likely to fear that what you long for, love, security, freedom, purpose, are threatened. And Jesus asks you to trust that he is preparing a place for you in his Father's house. It is a place where your deepest longings for love and security and freedom will be fulfilled. It is a place of warmth and affection. It is home. You know the only way. It is through Jesus. You know what home will look like. It will look like him. And you know that as you wait, Jesus is working through you to fulfill his purposes. So how do we respond to this? I suggest four ways that are on your um, handout. Notice also on your bulletin, there's a place that you can respond. And if you do respond and let us know how you want to respond, we as a staff will pray for you. And the way that you get those to us is to drop them in one of the boxes that are out in the foyer, either on your right or left as you leave. Four ways that we suggest, share the discussion questions with one another. Spend some time just talking through it. Go back, take a look in your Bible at these verses again. And just make a list. How does it describe Jesus? What does it say about him? Pray. Ask the Lord to help you see that Jesus is trustworthy even in the midst of whatever is stirring you or troubling you. And then the last one kind of may seem kind of weird. Invite someone who needs Jesus to a meal. Where does that come from? That comes from your purpose. That's the plan. That's what you're called to do, is to point people to Jesus. So take a step. Just invite someone out to a meal and start getting to know them at a deeper level. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. These are men and women who are here to pray with you no matter what you are facing. Why do we need prayer after a message like this? We need prayer because the troubles that we deal with are so real and so right here. 
and Jesus can seem so distant. And so what we need are people to stand with us, pray with us, and say, Lord, help me to know and trust that Jesus is at work for my good, that he truly is the way home, and that he has work for me to do today. Would you stand with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we are amazed that you love us so much, despite the fact that we do nothing to earn that love, despite the fact that there are so many things that we do that we know a perfect God would say, that's not right. But Lord, you know all of that. You know the deepest, darkest secrets in our soul the things that we want to hide even from ourselves. You know all of it, and you look at us and you say, I love you. And Lord, you sent your son to restore that relationship with us. But more than that, you have brought your son back home to you to prepare home for us. You have sent your son to reveal the way home to be the way home. And Lord, you give us purpose through your son. Help us to live in that confidence today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So let me leave you with this thought. Jesus is always, every moment, at work for you, in you, and through you for your good and his glory. Trust that no matter what you are facing today, he will work through you this week. You are dismissed. Come pray with us if you need to pray.